welcome to Money Matters TV. Uh, I'm your host in this episode. My name is James Chan, C-H-A-N, without the G. And I uh, founded my own practice, uh, which I named Asia Marketing and Management in 1983 to help companies build better relationships with China and other Asian countries. Today, I am with my co-host, Jim DiLorenzo, of hey Jim DiLorenzo Public Relations. Nice to see you again, James. Nice to see you again. And of course, as usual, in uh, these Money Matter TV program shows, uh, Jim and I will kind of talk about things that hopefully you'd like to hear uh, before we introduce our guest, uh, uh, our interviewee today. We have a very wonderful program. I'm sure that you enjoyed it. But in the meantime, Jim, about social media, about PR, public relations, tell me, what, what's the connection? Is there a connection? Do there, people come to you and ask for PR, public relations help, with social media? Yes, they do. And I think, for me, social media has become a component of my public relations campaigns for my clients and colleagues. And the way I like to use social media in those situations and one of the things I describe to people is that having a Twitter account mm -hmm. or having a LinkedIn page for your company or having a um, Instagram account. Yeah, I was about to say Instagram. <laughs> those seem to be the three most prevalent areas for especially in business to business communication or business to consumer communication. Those seem to be the three primary areas of social media that I like to focus on with my clients. And most of my clients are B2B. So I emphasize LinkedIn, whether it be a company page or an individual's page. Uh -huh. But I also emphasize Twitter because I think Twitter is a great way to share uh, thought leadership. Mm. And if you can establish through Twitter um, I've just written this new blog on this topic. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've written a blog on business process outsourcing, and I think you would enjoy it, that type of thing. If you can, if you can include a link to your blog on your Twitter feed, it gets traction for the blog article, and it also gets traction for you as an individual and as a company, because more people are seeing it. How many people are actually on Twitter every day? Meaning, roughly ballpark it, uh, really? I'd say probably a couple hundred million. You mean, that means they check their Twitter feed or Twitter messages more often than they read the newspapers, the Probab hard copy newspapers? Probably at this book? point. In fact, even I, as old school as I've sometimes been, mm -hmm. I don't have a subscription to a, to a daily newspaper anymore for the first time in I don't know how many years. I mean, I don't, I don't actually physically pick up a copy of the newspaper. And I was one of the last people that I knew that gave that up. Yeah. Uh, I have a digital subscription, right. but I also have a, a very active Twitter fo following of the newspapers that I like to look at. So when they post something, I'm getting it off of their Twitter okay. account. Very much hardcore PR kind of client relationship matter. It's on the issue. Yes. What if people who are reasonably young, <laughs> much younger than me, or at least, who believe that they are very good at sending tweets or very good with Twitter, why should they want help, let alone paying an expert to have the expert help them do better tweeting? Everybody needs an editor. Everybody should take a look at what they're sending out and make sure that they've spelled things correctly, if they've gotten the, the idea across. And what I help my clients do is develop the messages that they want to tell the world about their business, about their company, about their, as, them as an individual. And then we work off of those messages to create the tweets. So it, it's very, uh, easy to send out a tweet where you're retweeting an article that you saw. I see. And that's a great way to, to establish a presence on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're going to be sending out tweets, you want to make sure that you're not embarrassing yourself. You're mm -hmm. not causing a controversy. Do people know that? 
Do they know that they may be uh, embarrassing themselves? Do they know that their judgment may not be really on target or even uh, proper or graceful, shall I I think I people are beginning to realize it. I think that there was a, there was a, a trend maybe a year or so ago where people were just sending things out and not really giving it a great deal of thought. And that's, that trend started to change last year, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But I think more and more savvy business people mm -hmm. are taking advantage of Twitter to make sure that they deliver their messages correctly and they take the time to review things before they send yeah. it out. Generally, do you actually see a client in person, physical, uh, you know, in person, eyeball to eyeball with a, uh, a Twitter, uh, client, meaning somebody who needs help with tweeting. Do I, you actually see I have the sat, person? I, I have sat down one-on-one -on -one with all of the people that I work right. with. You won't just tweet them. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm I, so happy. I, I'm still a big believer in the personal <laughs> contact. That's I, the public I, relations I part of with, public relations. Yeah, I think that there are certain things, certain feelings, certain sensations, certain like confidence and trust and, and, and amity that you really can get unless you meet the person. And, and I think one of the ways that I have recently started telling people to use Twitter right. is almost like a, uh, we're open for business type of thing. Right. right. So that people know that you're out there, but then when they want to contact you, they contact you directly or mm -hmm. they contact you, you know, through your website or through email right. or the phone call. Right. I'm a, still a big believer in the phone calls, although the people who return my calls are becoming f fewer <laughs> and fewer. <laughs> But I still return, I still... They come, they come in cycles, right, you never know. Right. Yeah. By the way, which, which one is more dominant now in terms of social media importance? Uh, 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 Twitter or is it Instagram? I know Instagram is newer, even I know Instagram is newer. But before you even yeah. answer, I've noticed there's something new about Instagram, which is some companies, because you do B2B, some companies are already making use of younger people to kind of promote or market or place their products by having lots of pictures yes. on Instagram that bear the logos or the look right. of the merchandise of, let's say, people who are you know trying to sell to uh, consumers. Right, and so do people make use of Twitter for the same function? Yes, there's a lot of crossover between Instagram and Twitter on B2B, B2C uh, marketing. Yeah, B2C, right, B2C. So uh, you may want to have a very robust Instagram account with a lot of photos and video. Right. And you also may want to use Twitter to link people to the Instagram right. posts, but also create personal content just for Twitter. Yep. So you can create for both forums. Right. Okay. Well, I'm sure that we can continue with this because <laughs> it's uh, a big topic. I right know now. it's a big topic, and I, I really do not believe that I'm really good at social media. So maybe one day I'll knock on your door and say, Jim, help me with PR. I'll I'm be willing to pay. <laughs> I'll be happy to speak with you about that at any time. You Very know that, good. James. Very good. In the meantime, we do have uh, a question uh, from the viewer, uh, and this question is from Thomas Richards, and uh, the question is about rugby, which is like, why is rub rugby uh, get becoming more important, more popular, or more widely accepted uh, in the United States? Would you like to uh, uh, sure. tackle Th it, this th one? Thank you, James, and thank yeah. you, Thomas, for the question. Um, I've been involved with collegiate rugby for about five years now. Uh, I'm one of the public relations uh, specialists that works with the Penn Mutual Collegiate Rugby Championship every year in Philadelphia. And one of the things that I have seen five, six years ago when I first got involved, I really didn't know that much about rugby myself. Uh, I had been in college sports uh, public relations for many years prior to uh, working in the business areas. but I had not been involved with rugby because rugby is not an NCAA sanctioned sport. So I really paid very little attention to it earlier in my career. But rugby has begun to grow in importance and in prominence in the United States 
And one of the chief reasons for that is because it became an Olympic sport once again in the uh, 2016 Olympics, which was the first time in about 100 years that rugby was included in the Olympic Games. Uh, the particular form of rugby that's, that's in the Olympics is rugby sevens, which is seven players on each side and seven minute halves. So you have a 14 minute game played by 14 players, which is a very fast paced game. Uh, the United States uh, began building the development of rugby in the United States through the college programs. And the college programs are beginning to offer scholarships. Uh, again, they're not an NCAA sport, but they have seen a great deal of growth in the sport of rugby because it's a less violent and less injury prone form of contact sport. Uh, and with the attention being played to, paid to uh, football, causing concussions and other serious injuries, people are now more likely to want to play rugby and, and have fun with it. And there's a lot of sportsmanship involved. There's a lot of camaraderie involved. And the other thing that has fueled the growth of rugby in the United States, James, mm -hmm. is yep. that uh, there are now women's teams. And right. it's a, wi it's a, it's a women's you. Olympic sport yeah. as well. Right. And uh, it's a great way for some of the colleges mm -hmm. to offset scholarships that they give to male, male football right. players. Oh. And they can uh, be more in compliance with Title IX structures I see. Uh, by offering scholarships for, for women to play rugby. And because it's becoming more, um, uh, growing more on the college campuses, the high school programs are now starting to offer rugby teams. So it's not just all boys anymore. Right. No, it's, it's, it's yeah. boys and girls, right. men and women, right. beginning in high school and continuing through you mean college. Mixed, actually? Even oh, no, there, there are no, no, there are no, no co yes, there are no co ed yeah, squads. No co ed. No, right. Okay. So at least. Uh, but as well. that, and as that continues to grow on the, on the grassroots level, you're seeing more and more advertisers and companies right. willing to sponsor right. teams like Penn Mutual has done. Yeah. I'm sure that we can talk more about this uh, particular matter because it's fascinating. Uh, but in the meantime, we do want more questions from the viewers. And this is how you send in your questions to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, send us your questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Welcome to Money Matters TV. Um, uh, again, my name is James Chan. I'm your host today. Uh, we have a very interesting, uh, I would say quite exciting episode because I have a young gentleman by the name of Zachary Waldman. He calls himself Zach, uh, who uh, is the founder of his own business. And uh, Zach, welcome to Money Matters TV. Thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. And of course, you know Jim yeah, De, Lo De Lorenzo, and we're going to work you over with a <laughs> lot of questions about cyber security, which Excellent. is what uh, Zach's uh, profession is. And of course, his company, his company is called Falchion Systems. But mind you, Falchion, uh, you, you don't say it Falchion or Falchion, it's Falchion, as in the word mission or station. Uh, how did you pick? Falchion Systems as a name to begin with. Of course, yeah. So um, my co-founder and I are both um, avid gamers and also big fans of medieval European history. Oh. Um, so <laughs> we, our solution that we were designing, the whole point was that it should be applicable to as many people as possible. So it, there's a version of for huge enterprises, but also a version for someone who's just sitting at home and wants to protect their computer. And the Falchion, back in medieval Europe, was used by different people depending on your region. In some regions, it could only be wielded by royalty. Um, and it was used exclusively for dueling and things along those lines. What's the look of a Felsian weapon? Uh, it, it looks similar to a rapier sword. Okay. It's a right. very, very thin. It's okay. not a huge broadsword. Right. Okay. Um, 
But in other regions, it was actually used by peasants to cut down wheat in their fields. So the oh. idea was that it could be used by the biggest and the smallest, and you'd still get value out of it. But how is it related to cybersecurity? Well, it's related to our tool. Our tool can be used okay. by the biggest right. and the smallest yeah, people. Yeah. Now, yeah. What does your tool, what does the Falchion Systems pro platform do in, in terms of cybersecurity? Right. So our platform is primarily, what it does, it's a concept called micro-virtualization, which is something that people in the field probably have heard many times. It is a- What's the word again? Micro-virtualization. Virtualization. Yes. Okay. It's a buzzword that's thrown around a lot. Traditionally, mm -hmm. it's applied to big data centers, mm -hmm. so that, for example, have you heard of Amazon Web Services, sure. AWS, right? So the way that AWS is able to host so many different companies, sites, and servers is through micro-segmentation or micro-virtualization in, in, in another vernacular. So there's actually separation between everyone's products so that no one can be messing with each other. And what we've done is we've applied that same technology on a much smaller scale and increased the performance on your desktop alone so nothing's being run remotely. And what this does is it allows your users to be inside a web browser and let's say they fall for some trick and they accidentally download something. It stays contained inside this lightweight container that's holding the web browser instead of going in and infecting your system. Who, oh, okay. who do you attract? Who do you want to attract? What companies do you want to attract as your customers or clients? Yeah, so right now we're, um, we're preparing for our first beta and we already have a few people lined up. Uh, but the biggest customers we're trying to look for are people who, A, care about cybersecurity, because it doesn't matter if your organization doesn't care about cybersecurity, you're not going to want to implement a solution. Right. Uh, you, we also want people probably mid to large range, because people with experienced staff are going to be able to use the full tool set, and we want to be able to test all the whole thing that we've made, not just the small version. Will the U.S. government find what you offer useful, practical, or even... Uh you know, in great demand. Well, we're hoping so. Um, the rise of so I think it was there's sixty there was a sixty seven percent growth in social engineering attacks last year. Oh wow! And I think it it cost a com around three million dollars per ex per, per event last mm -hmm. year. So oh, wow! It's a very very costly type of attack vector that is incredibly easy to implement and very hard to defend. Tell yeah, yeah go ahead. I was going to ask what is a social engineering attack? Right. So a social engineering attack is kind of a, it's a broad form. There are different types of social engineering attacks. But as a whole, it's basically tricking a user or even an administrator, a network administrator sometimes, into either forfeiting information or downloading a payload onto their system that's going to allow you to remotely manipulate them. Okay. So. You mean by clicking on something yeah, that clicking, you're not supposed to touch. Yeah, or even recently there's been a resurgence in something called drive-by downloads where you don't even have to click on it. You just have to visit the site and it'll run. Wow, start that is very dangerous. It is very dangerous. It's called drive-by. Yeah, drive-by download. Download. Attacks. Yep. Simply by passing through. Yep. You get infected. Yep. So you got to be really this careful where you view. <laughs> then how would people know? What, what, where places, what places to avoid? I, I, you well, know. At the end of the day, most people don't. I, like Experienced professionals are, such as myself or any, anyone else who studies cybersecurity even a little bit, it's pretty obvious when something's fishy about a site to us. It's, very, it's really hard to fish someone like me. Not saying it's impossible, because right. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to there is no 100% in cybersecurity. There never is. Um, but it's a lot more difficult to fish someone with a lot of experience or even to trick them into going to a site. But there, at the end of the day, people who don't keep it in the front of their minds all the time, who aren't constantly thinking yeah. about how this affects my information security, are very easy to trick, even if they're smart in other mm -hmm. areas. Right. Can industrial companies, manufacturing companies, use your services? Yeah, of course. Uh, any, any company that uses computers and wants to make sure that their computers aren't getting taken down by viruses or wants to protect their data can use our mm -hmm. tool. Zach, when you're, you're a, a currently a, uh, at East Stroudsburg. That's correct. In the incubator program at East Stroudsburg. Yep. And th you've had Falchion Systems o up and running for about a year now, is that correct? A little over a year, a little over yeah. How what was the impetus for you to start the business? And Great question. Yeah, really, I was about to ask you the same thing. Yeah, so the, the genesis of our company actually started way back when I was in high school, actually. So um, 
at the end of high school and partially through my freshman year, I worked for a company called Pinnacle Health, which is now UPMC Pinnacle, because I'm sure you're, you might be aware I of all the healthcare mergers happening yeah. right mm -hmm. now. So UPMC merged with Pinnacle. But um, we were working for Pinnacle Health, and we were infrastructure engineers and network technicians, which meant uh, Nick and I, my co-founder. We did switch programming on the Cisco switches, which I'm sure some viewers might be aware of, some might not be, and network design, but also whenever a computer went down or if we needed something to go be replaced, we were the ones that they sent out. We kind of served a little bit of double duty okay. uh, during our time there. And we were having a consistent problem where it was like once every two weeks, we'd have a doctor or a nurse's administrator or some something, someone would be like, hey, my computer is glitching up. I don't know if I got something. We, and we would have to go out, take that computer out of rotation, bring out a new one, re-image the whole computer. And that right there would wipe out about four hours of time that you could be doing that, that person could be doing their job. And wow. it's also eating time out of me, which I'm an infrastructure engineer and I should be beefing up the infrastructure security and working on back end, but instead I'm having to re-image this computer and basically put a file in with HIPAA saying like, hey, we had a very small instant. And it was happening so consistently that we're like, there's gotta be a way without just hard blocking people's ability to use the internet to prevent us from having to go out there. We're fine if it happens as long as we can keep it contained. That's, that's not a problem. And that's really where it came from. And then we did our research in it. We actually published a paper in the um, IEEE DASC conference uh, 2017 that we presented it in Florida. And we thought, hey, maybe there's commercial applications for this. So we ran with it from there. You know, I have two related questions. Number one, what gives you the goal to <laughs> want to found your own business and to be a boss instead of working for the man or for the lady. What gives you that goal? Number two, related, how do you find clients who pay you? Right. Uh, so number one, uh, I think part of it for me is the sense of personal freedom. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, if you work for someone, even if you do make a ton of money, mm -hmm if you get fired or if you screw up or do something wrong at your job and like you have to seriously screw up to get fired, usually they'll give you more than one chance. But in general, if you get fired, you're still gonna have to go find another job to support yourself at your current lifestyle. Mm -hmm. If you own your own company and you build it and you end up be achieving a certain level of wealth, you are truly free in the sense that if I go work somewhere and I start not liking what it is, I can quit on the day. I don't have to wait until I have something lined up. Yeah. And I, I'd rather not be pseudo free. I'd rather be actually free to do whatever I want for the rest of my life. But you could be a good employee, right? Yeah, you could. I, I am you, a good, you, I'd like to think I am a good uh, yeah, employee. Right. Yeah, right, yeah. No, yeah. I do, I do work very hard and I, in yeah. the, I worked at Lockheed Martin and right. IBM and I really did right. enjoy my time there. Mm -hmm. I just, I like not having to be tethered to something. I like having the choice to leave anytime I want. Then how do you find companies who are willing to pay for your services? Pay yeah, is the key word. Yeah, paying is the key word. Um, so basically, there, obviously the resurgence of social engineering and the fact that the insider threat is another way of describing it. The mm -hmm. insider threat is either intentional sabotage or your users being tricked into doing something. Mm -hmm. um, the insider threat is so prevalent right now because we've got all these other tools that do analytics and stuff and can protect your back end and encryption at all sorts of different levels and you have a demilitarized zone is what it's called which air gaps your internal network from the actual internet. But at the end of the day, if one user screws up and isn't careful, you can all go crashing down. That's all it takes. So there's a pretty significant need for something that's going to eliminate um, the impact or at least significantly reduce the impact of poor user behavior on your IT infrastructure because it's really interesting. The way IT departments spend money on cybersecurity it's not like, okay, we're gonna spend this much and we're just gonna implement the solutions. There's a, you do risk analysis. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, so this is the probability that this type of attack is gonna happen on us. Mm -hmm. And if it does happen, this is how much it's gonna cost. Mm -hmm. So we need to gauge how much are we willing to spend each year to reduce this risk. So for example, if you've got a risk that, it, it, according to your calculations, costs $800,000 a year, and someone has a solution, but their solution is $2 million a year, that's not worth it. Mm. You're spending more than the risk is actually costing you. So, but for example, for us, we did a example calculation on a fake medium-sized company and their approximate 
risk value is around $600,000 a year into these types of attacks. And we can provide our solution to a company at that size for around 300 k so you're saving $200,000 right. there. And that's the key, and that's something that a lot of cybersecurity companies, especially a lot of people my age who haven't worked in the industry a lot, like I may be young, but I've been in the industry for five years. So I actually, I have a little more experience than one would assume. That's something that a lot of people don't realize is the risk analysis that goes into it. Because at the end of the day, it's all about protecting your money. Mm -hmm. How do you overcome the questions that uh, older professionals may have with dealing with a younger professional? Great question. Yeah, your, your yeah. age thing. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, so I do get asked a lot because, because of my age. I will say my, my personality, <laughs> I tend to get along with older people very well, yeah. like oftentimes more than my peers. Um, <laughs> so interestingly, once the conversation- Be careful what you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, once the conversation yeah. starts, yeah. Um, it, it usually goes smoothly. But obviously people want to know that I've been involved in something before like they don't want some kid who has just gone to college and never been in the industry coming in and telling them hey i got this new solution for yeah, you and right. it's better than what you're doing right it's i'm telling you this from experience working for a hospital working for ibm and then working for lockheed martin so i've got the cybersecurity experience from working for a hospital and doing like network configurations firewall configs there and then um, also dealing with some endpoint security problems. And at IBM, I worked for their CISO, developing cybersecurity tools. So you have experience beyond your years. Yes. I like to say. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, and usually I am questioned about it, but if I just calmly explain that, well, I, here's my credentials. I've worked at all these places and I do have a couple active security certs. So usually that's enough to calm their nerves. Plus in the tech industry, there, there is, there is honestly, there's a little bit of ageism in the tech industry. Younger people are tend to be preferred over older people Interesting. in tech. Cool. Which, um, while I'm not sure that's the right way to go, I I love talking to older people in tech because they know everything. I, I, the the lingo for it is they're called graybeards. The <laughs> the guys who like originally coded the Linux core and stuff like that. They know <laughs> everything there is to know. So I love meeting people. Like sure, that. that's a good that's a good mindset. Really, you know, just just you're open. Yeah. You, you're not you're not so segmented, or you you don't segregate people. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, there's 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 plenty of old people who are far more talented than some of these new college grads who won't get the time of day just because they're 50, which is a shame. Yeah, I think we are winding down. Okay. We, uh, we should get you over uh, again because there is so much to learn about cybersecurity. Yeah, I'd be glad to. So we are coming to uh, the conclusion of this episode. Uh, our next speak, uh, our next host, our next guest. I'm sorry, our next guest will be Steve Smolinski uh, with uh, Benari. Uh, he is a business consultant. I know Steve, and he is a very interesting person with a completely different uh, perspective. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. And we would like to hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you.